Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So good afternoon and welcome. I, my name is Kirsten Wiley, and I'm here today to introduce and to welcome Ted Miguel, who is visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Uh, Ted Miguel is here today to discuss why poor countries are poor and what to do about it. He writes that it is not for lack of effort or interest, but rather lies in understanding the twin evils of violence and corruption, which means getting into the heads of the so-called economic gangsters. Mr. Miguel is Associate Professor of Economics and Director of the Center of Evaluations for Global Action at the University of California, Berkeley. His main research focus is African economic development, including work on the economic causes and consequences of violence, the impact of ethnic divisions on local collective action, and interactions between health, education, and productivity for the poor. He has conducted field work in Kenya, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, and India. He is a faculty research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research, associate editor of the Quarterly Journal of Economics, Journal of Development Economics and Review of Economics and Statistics, and recipient of the 2005 Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship. Please join me in welcoming Ted Miguel to, to Microsoft to discuss his new book, Economic Gangsters. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'm an economist at Berkeley, as Kirsten just mentioned. My uh, co-author, Ray Fisman, is an economist at Columbia. And we set out to write a book that illustrates ideas that we feel are really central to understanding international development. And those are issues of corruption and violence. The book, Economic Angsters, is based on our research findings as well as research by other uh, economists. We tell a bunch of stories in the book. And the stories are based on our own personal experiences doing field work, in many different parts of the world, uh, from traveling to uh, remote villages in East Africa all the way to booming stock exchanges in Southeast Asia. And while traveling the back roads in a lot of different countries, we were constantly struck, uh, found ourselves wondering why some countries have been so successful in economic development over the past generation, others have failed so miserably. There's a tremendous amount of uh, disparity some countries, mainly in East Asia, have been amazingly successful. In one generation, they've leapfrogged from abject poverty to prosperity. But in many other parts of the world, in many countries in South Asia, in Central America, in Sub-Saharan Africa, people remain as poor on average as they did 30 or 40 years ago. So the country where I've done uh, more work than, than any other is Kenya. Kenya is an example of that sort of disappointment. Uh, Kenyans today are just as poor as they were in the 60s when they became independent. The fraction of roads that are paved is just as low today as it was decades ago. There really hasn't been progress uh, on those dimensions. And half the people on Earth still live on less than $2 a day. So a lot of people still haven't uh, really experienced any of the benefits of economic development. But in trying to understand what went wrong in countries like Kenya, we're really struck by the role of corruption and violence. Kenya is a country that's experienced coups and ethnic violence and massive corruption scandals and government embezzlement scandals. And when you think about what went wrong in Kenya, you can't avoid these issues. The people that carry out the corruption, the theft, the violence, the bribery are the people we call economic gangsters in our book. And economic gangsters come in many different shapes and sizes, everything from African rebel warlords who steal and smuggle diamonds to fund their rebel groups that end up terrorizing the population to Asian dictators who build crony capitalist networks to enrich themselves and their families. Uh, an example from uh, US history is somebody like Al Capone. Uh, people know Al Capone as the head of the, the mob in Chicago during Prohibition. What people don't know is Al Capone actually started out his career as an accountant for a construction firm. He was very well versed in costs and benefits. And he was a very shrewd and calculating businessman. Uh, it just happened that he was in a line of work where you settled your business disputes with machine guns rather than uh, in courts. So economic gangsters are folks like Al Capone who very often act in very cunning, almost rational, strategic ways. And that's what makes them 
uh, interesting to us as economists. We can study a lot of their behavior using the tools of economics. We can figure out what their motivations are and hopefully come up with policies to start fighting economic gangsters. Now, in addition to being intellectually interesting to figure out uh, what's causing corruption and violence and how to deal with them, these issues are, are actually central to a lot of debates in international development today, particularly debates over foreign aid. So the debate over foreign aid today is really polarized. There's uh, one camp that argues we should massively ratchet up foreign aid, double it, triple it, quadruple it. The idea there is that uh, poor countries are caught in a sort of trap, a poverty trap. They're so poor that they can't save. They're so poor they can't invest in schooling or in building roads or the other things that will help them escape from poverty. They're so poor that the only way we can get them out of their poverty is by a massive infusion of foreign aid to raise up their incomes even for a short period of time to some decent level where they can then start saving and investing and getting out of poverty. That's one camp. But critics contend that we've already given trillions of dollars in foreign aid to poor countries. And very often we don't have very much to show for it. Part of the reason we don't has to do with, with economic angsters. Too much foreign aid was stolen by corrupt governments. Too many of the fruits of foreign aid, the new schools and roads, were destroyed by civil war, by conflict. So figuring out what economic gangsters do, how pervasive th these problems are, and how to stop them, how to fight them, is really central going forward to figure out how, how to improve the foreign aid system today. And that's really our goal in the book, to understand these issues of corruption and violence, their causes, their consequences, and think about ways to try to solve them. Now, in that research goal, we uh, immediately face a number of challenges. The first challenge we face is a problem of data. Corruption and violence are actually very hard things to measure. If the person giving a bribe and the person receiving a bribe are doing a halfway decent job of it, that bribe isn't going to show up on a balance sheet. It's not going to be in your tax return. It's not going to be in any sort of official data source at all. So we have to use forensic techniques and new approaches to try to find the fingerprints left behind by corruption. You might think measuring violence would be a lot easier. In a civil war, there's a lot of body bags, bags to count, for one, unfortunately. Uh, you might think that, that's easier. It turns out not to be easier. Statistical agencies shut down in wartime. Censuses are not conducted. And very often, the only information we get on the number of casualties or the extent of, of wartime damage is uh, provided by the warring parties themselves. So it's no better than propaganda. So data is a big problem. Even when we solve the data problem, and in the book we go through a number of new ways you can, you can solve these problems and measure what has been hard to measure in the past, we face another problem. And that's what we call the chicken and egg problem of causality. So what came first, you know, the chicken or the egg? Well, our poor, we know when we look at, at poor countries, they tend to be more corrupt than rich countries. We know that they tend to have more violence than rich countries. But was it the poverty that caused the corruption or the corruption that caused the poverty? And the same thing for violence. These are very tricky issues to try to sort out. And we spend time in the book trying to disentangle these problems to solve uh, these chicken and egg problems. And we do so through stories, uh, stories based on our own research and our own field work. Let me start with one of our stories based on joint research of mine and my uh, co-authors. Imagine the city of Bogota, Colombia in 1993. Bogota in the early 90s was the murder capital of the world. There were 4,000 something murders a year. Uh, just an order of magnitude uh, higher than a place like Seattle or San Francisco or even New York. There were kidnapping, kidnappings uh, galore. Uh, there was a lot of chaos and disorder on the streets. People didn't follow traffic rules. People, uh, crime rates were very high. The city was fed up. The population was fed up with the disorder, the crime, the corruption in their city. They were fed up with the traditional political parties. And what they did in 1993 is they elected a mayor who called himself an anti-politician. He was a former professor of math and philosophy at a local university. His name was Antanas Mokas. And he came to power promising new solutions to these problems. So he took over this sprawling capital city of millions of people. No experience. The first thing he did to try to fight crime, and in particular, all the uh, traffic violations and whatnot he saw on city streets was he stationed mimes in the busiest intersections in downtown Bogota. So mimes, people in tights and face paint. He hired 400 mimes from the local theater school. And what the mimes did, they weren't armed with guns. They were only armed with red cards. And what they would do is when people would jaywalk, they would follow the jaywalkers and mock them, waving red cards around. 
when people would run red lights, the mimes would run after them, waving their red cards. And the citizens would cheer uh, the mimes' uh, attempts to, to ridicule and humiliate people who were breaking the rules. This wasn't a traditional sort of policy. It's kind of a wacky bit of showmanship. But by all accounts, very quickly, people started thinking twice about jaywalking in downtown Bogota. No one wants to be ridiculed and humiliated. Now, in addition to the showmanship, Mocus actually carried out a bunch of other more traditional reforms. He uh, implemented a gun buyback program to try to get guns out of the hands of criminals. He, f he laid off, there were mass firings of corrupt traffic police who were always taking bribes. Uh, he also uh, uh, invested in these large art installations and libraries in the poorest neighborhoods of the city to try to build some sense of civic pride, even in the shanty towns of the city. And Mocus was, by all accounts, incredibly successful. By 2004, murder rates were down 70%. Other crime was down massively. And Bogota today is seen as a real model city in Latin America. The city has experienced a renaissance. The city is safer. People are proud of their city. There's a lot of civic pride. And when asked what uh, he could attribute his success to, Mocus always pointed to cultural change, things like the mimes that started changing attitudes, started changing norms, cultural norms about right and wrong as really the key to his success. So, Mocus' success for us on the outside is a little harder to evaluate. He combined traditional reforms that did things that changed economic incentives with these cultural reforms and the showmanship. What's really, uh, what really caused the change in crime and change in rule breaking in Bogota? Well, this is a very important issue. A lot of countries want to deal with crime. A lot of countries want to deal with corruption. The World Bank has made corruption one of their leading issues, policy issues, uh, over the past few years. But it's a hard thing to sort out. There's a lot of things going on. If we compare different countries with different levels of corruption, you can see immediately why it's a hard nut to crack. So let's think of two countries with pretty, ex pretty different experiences with corruption. On the one hand, there's Norway, which according to all the corruption perception surveys is one of the least corrupt countries in the world. And let's compare them to Nigeria, which according to those same corruption perception indices is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Why is Norway so much less corrupt than Nigeria? Well, there's a lot of different possible explanations, and there's a lot of differences between these two countries. First of all, Norway has a more efficient police force and judicial system, uh, whereas in Nigeria, police are always taking bribes, and judges can easily be bought off. But beyond that, there's a very strong cultural sense of propriety and following the rules in Norway, while in Nigeria, people complain, Nigerians complain all the time about how a culture of corruption has just permeated all spheres of life. So what's causing that difference between these two countries? Is it law enforcement, or is it culture and conscience and these other factors? It's hard to figure out. Now, my co-author and I put on our researcher hats and said, well, what would be the ideal situation? What would be the ideal experiment that we could carry out to try to figure out which of these two factors was really the key? So the ideal experiment would be, imagine if we could get government officials from all over the world, thousands of government officials from every country on Earth, Put them in the same place where they're carrying out their official duties, but put them in an environment where there's no legal enforcement. They could be as corrupt as they want without any sort of punishment. Then if we compare the behavior of the Norwegian government officials and the Nigerian government officials in that setting without legal enforcement, the differences between how corrupt they were could be attributed to things like culture or conscience, things other than law enforcement. So this is a sort of anarchist fantasy land that I've described, but it's actually remarkably close to the situation that prevailed on the streets of New York around UN Plaza uh, with UN diplomats. Diplomats from all over the world, thousands of diplomats live in New York, work in New York, but they have diplomatic immunity. They can commit petty crimes and violations and they can't be punished. The government can't do anything to, to them because of diplomatic immunity. And something that diplomats are very known for in New York is accumulating parking tickets. I grew up in the New York area and whenever you drive in Manhattan, if there was a car parked on the sidewalk or blocking a driveway or in front of a hydrant, it was pretty much guaranteed that that was going to be a diplomatic plate on that vehicle. Um, so we can see by comparing the number of diplomatic parking tickets accumulated by diplomats in different countries, we can get a sense of, in the absence of law enforcement, how much do culture and conscience constrain the behavior of these government officials? And actually, parking violations fit the definition of corruption pretty well. It's the abuse of some official power or official privilege for private gain. That's the definition that Transparency International uses. So what do we find? First off, these few thousand UN diplomats get a lot of parking tickets in New York City. 
1996, the first year of our data set, which, by the way, the uh, finance department in New York City was very eager to share with us because they want <laughs> the world to know about these diplomats that are menacing their streets. Diplomats, these few thousand diplomats got 160,000 unpaid parking tickets in one year, worth many, many millions of dollars to the city. Just to show you how bad it can get, there was one diplomat from Kuwait. We call him Ambassador X in the book because we don't want to you know, out him publicly. Um, he got the most violations. So he started off slowly. In 1999, he only got 249 unpaid tickets. But in 2000, he really hit his stride. He got 526 unpaid parking tickets in that year. So that's more than two unpaid parking tickets every single workday all year. 2001 was a little bit of an off year. He dropped down to 351 unpaid parking tickets in that year. Still a, a respectable uh, level. Now, while most of his violations were, in fairness, uh, to be found near the UN Plaza, near where he worked. He also had a string of violations in Greenwich Village on the Upper West Side, places far away from his official duties, but close to some of New York's finest whining and dining, uh, which he presumably was, taking, uh, was partaking in. Now, unfortunately for New Yorkers, Ambassador X wasn't alone. There were 17 countries whose diplomats averaged at least 50 unpaid parking tickets per diplomat per year. And here's a list of countries. Kuwait came in first because of Ambassador X, then Egypt, Chad, Sudan, Bulgaria, Mozambique, Albania, Angola, Senegal, Pakistan, Ivory Coast, Zambia, Morocco, Ethiopia, Nigeria, and Syria. So you can see those countries come from all over the world. There's some Eastern European countries, Middle Eastern countries, African countries. On average, that group of countries is a very high corruption set of countries. If we look at the countries that had zero, literally zero unpaid parking tickets for the eight years that we have data, they include Australia, Canada, Colombia, so maybe Mocus uh, was making a difference, uh, Denmark, Ecuador, Greece, Ireland, Israel, Japan, Netherlands, Norway, Panama, Sweden, Turkey, and UK. So again, countries kind of located all over. Uh, the world, on average, this is a very low corruption set of countries. The Scandinavian countries, Japan, Canada, in all the corruption perception indices are very low corruption countries. When we look across all countries, not just the very top and bottom, this statistical relationship comes out very strongly. Countries with higher levels of perceived corruptions, their diplomats get tons of unpaid parking tickets. Uh, diplomats from countries with, l with less corruption get zero or very few. And that controls that, that holds even when we control statistically for income and other things you might think could make a difference. So what does it all mean? What this means is cultures of corruption matter. You can take government officials thousands of miles away from home, put them in New York. Uh, they're living there for years. And years later, they're still behaving in a, in a manner reminiscent of government officials back home. Cultures of corruption matter. They're persistent. and. Um, clearly a menace to New York City. So it looks like Mayor Mokis was right. To deal with corruption, to really understand the causes of corruption, we can't ignore culture. Culture matters, and it's got to be part of, uh, part of the solution. Uh, one thing people ask is what, where the US fell in these rankings uh, of diplomatic parking tickets. Now, it turns out US diplomats uh, don't have diplomatic immunity in the US, in the UN mission. So, Fortunately or unfortunately for U.S. diplomats, uh, there's, there's no data uh, on their behavior. It may seem a little strange to you. I'm an economist here, someone trained in looking at incentives and trade-offs, talking about culture. Uh, but the corruption example shows that both culture and incentives matter in uh, understanding behavior. Some other issues, though, you might think, uh, have got to be all culture. They have to be cases where incentives don't matter. And I've studied one such issue, which is the issue of witchcraft and witch killing. Uh, on, on the surface, understanding uh, witch attacks and witch hunts and witch killing seems like the epitome of a phenomenon that would be based, that would be culturally based, based on superstition or psychology, not on economic uh, incentives. It's the kind of issue we in the US think of as ancient history too, something that happened long ago. Unfortunately, um, witch killing still takes place a lot around the world today. I've, I, I study witch killing in Tanzania, and the district in rural Tanzania where I've done field work, half of all murders are murders of people accused of being witches. It's an unbelievably common 
phenomenon. And it's not just in Tanzania. There's uh, lots of witch killings still going on in Ghana, uh, in Bihar state in India, in Bolivia, uh, in Kenya. So it's still something that goes on. Um, so again, you might think economics can't have anything to do with explaining it. It turns out that that uh, is wrong. It's not what we found in, in, in our field work. So let me tell you a little bit more about these witch killings in Tanzania. The first thing to understand is who's getting attacked and, and, and who's attacking them. Uh, the victims are almost all old women. Uh, they're women who uh, may not be able to work that much. They're, uh, they're quite elderly. And the people who attack them, typically witches are killed in Tanzania, they're hacked to death with machetes. It's, a, it's an unbelievably brutal crime. The people who kill them come from their own immediate family or extended family and kin network. In fact, um, anthropologists who study witchcraft in sub-Saharan Africa have called uh, witchcraft the dark side of kinship because witch accusations and witch attacks so often occur within families, among intimates. Um, so the people being killed are very often great aunts or grandmas being killed by their nephews or grandchildren. Very kind of shocking stuff. The first hint that economic factors matter and matter a lot when we collected data, we collected data over the course of 10 years in 70 villages in rural Tanzania, was the victims of witch killing came from the poorest households in these villages. They were the households that had the least land, that had the fewest assets. Uh, that didn't have a radio, that didn't have a bicycle, that didn't even have these basic things. It was the poorest household in a very poor district of, of the country. But that's not the real kicker. The real kicker is the number of witch killings in rural Tanzania skyrockets in years of economic distress. So this is an overwhelmingly agrarian area. People live or die based on the agricultural cycle. When the rains are good and their crops grow, there's enough to eat. When the rains fail, when there's a drought or a flood and their crops fail, People are desperate, especially in these very poor households that don't have the assets to sell, to sell off, to buffer against economic calamities. The number of witch killings in a drought year or a flood year in this part of Tanzania double immediately in that year. There's a lot more witch killings in that year. And in fact, the murder rate among elderly women in these bad years, these drought or flood years, is higher than the murder rate in Bogota in its worst years of the 1980s. They're at real risk of attack. What's going on in these households? Well, Tanzania is one of the poorest countries in the world. This is one of the poorest districts in that country. These are the poorest households there. In years when the rains fail, these households are really at subsistence. They're incredibly desperate. There may not be enough food to go around. So what are the solutions? Well, one solution might be to take whatever little bit of millet or sorghum or corn that the, that the household has and divide it equally among all household members. But that would not be a very good solution in many cases. Dividing food equally could actually put everybody at risk of starvation. All human beings need to meet some minimum caloric requirement just to meet basal metabolism. You'd actually need to target certain people to get food and others not to get food to make sure at least somebody will live in those difficult years. And the people who get targeted are elderly women. In this grim lottery, when there's not enough to go around, it's elderly women who draw the short straw. Why elderly women? They have a number of disadvantages. First of all, the old in general won't be as productive on the farm as the young. They're seen as a burden on the household. Women also have a lot less social influence than men in rural Tanzania. There are elders councils in place in rural Tanzania, but they're all composed of male elders. There's no equivalent for women. Male elders are politically influential and important. Female elders aren't. Another big difference has to do with marriage. In this part of Tanzania, when women marry, they marry outside their birth village. They go to their husband's village. So old men are surrounded by their birth kin. Old women are surrounded by their in-laws. And it doesn't end well for them. So uh, people are laughing about the in-laws, and uh, <laughs> especially some of the women in the back. Um, culture matters. By talking about the economic rationale, we're not saying culture doesn't matter. People in Western Tanzania really believe in witchcraft. It's very real to them. When someone is attacked as a witch, the person killing her really believes she's a witch. At the same time, we can't ignore the underlying economic logic. When there's an extreme resource shortage, economic imperatives, the economic calculus of survival means almost anybody can be turned into a killer. The same sort of economic logic actually applies beyond witch killing to broader societal forms of violence. And the most important form of violence 
in, in Africa is civil war. 70% of African countries have had at least one year of civil conflict since 1980, 70%. It's really more the norm than the exception. And again, when we think about you know, in, in the Western media, when they talk about the causes of civil war, people hone in on these cultural explanations. Oh, it's got to be you know, ethnic violence or tribal rivalries or some history of religious divisions that's causing it. And surely in some places those factors are important. But it actually turns out that economic factors are equally important, if not more so. And we can predict where conflicts are going to occur based on economic data. It's a very similar sort of logic to the example I just gave you in witch killing. We looked across all sub-Saharan African countries. It turns out in the year following a drought, a big drop in rainfall from one year to the next, the risk of civil war increases by half. So in a good rainfall year, the risk of civil war in an African country is about 20%. In the year following a drought, it rises to almost 30% just in the next year. Economic calamities can serve as a trigger for political violence in sub-Saharan Africa. It's a very big increase in risk due to economic uh, factors. One of the things that, that's nice about using rainfall to try to understand the causes of violence is it starts letting us get around these chicken and egg problems of causality that I talked about before. Remember, is it poverty causing violence? Is it violence causing poverty? It's something that researchers are always trying to grapple with uh, in our work. The great thing about rainfall is it literally falls from the sky, out of the control of any human being, falls from the sky onto the ground and affects economic conditions in these agrarian societies, and that translates into conflict. But it isn't the case that conflict on the ground or poverty on the ground is going to affect rainfall that year. We know what, what direction the causality is going. We know what the chicken is and what the egg is. The chicken, I guess the chicken comes first or does the egg come first? Well, uh, here the rainfall comes first. That affects economic conditions and it's the poverty that drives the violence. So it looks like poverty is really driving violence here. What can we do to stop armed conflicts and witch killing now that we know that extreme economic circumstances can set off violence? In the book, in Economic Gangsters, we propose a, propose a new type of foreign aid mechanism that would address this problem. We call it Rapid Conflict Prevention Support. If you're going to work in development, you need a good acronym. So ours is RCPS. Um, foreign aid donors right now, when they provide aid, uh, think of it as an investment, very much like that poverty trap view I talked about before. They think of it as an investment in education or in roads to try to lift countries permanently out of poverty. That's a very worthy goal. We're not against that kind of foreign aid. But that foreign aid as an investment angle is only part of the story. We think foreign aid should also serve as a form of insurance. And that's what rapid conflict prevention support could do. Foreign aid donors could monitor what rainfall conditions look like in different countries to see when a drought is starting to occur, when flooding is breaking out, when commodity price fluctuations are causing a lot of volatility, volatile incomes for farmers. In those circumstances, when farmers are at risk of big drops in income, foreign aid should kick in quickly, immediately, to try to bolster their incomes before their incomes fall off a cliff. Because we know that once incomes fall off a cliff, civil conflict, political instability are, are usually close behind. So foreign aid as insurance is a new way to conceive of foreign aid. Um, we think it would be more cost effective than a lot of current approaches. We think of it as something like preventive medicine. You take a vaccine early in the flu season to make sure you don't get sick. It's cost effective, it's smart, rather than having to deal with being sick later on. There's actually a model in one African country that could serve uh, other African countries well. And, and, and that model is what's called the Drought Relief Program in Botswana. So Botswana is one of Africa's most stable countries, most prosperous countries. Starting in the 1970s, uh, the Botswanan government instituted this program to monitor rainfall conditions. And when droughts were just starting, they kicked in emergency food aid to rural areas and a bunch of public works jobs for the unemployed to try to bolster incomes for people at risk of uh, really hunger. Botswana is a very dry place. They suffer from a lot of drought. This program has been incredibly successful. Botswana hasn't had a single year of civil war since independence. It's been one of the most peaceful and prosperous countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So others could use this as a model for their own efforts. Well, what's the way forward? I've talked about one approach, which is rapid conflict prevention support. One of our goals in writing this book was to put together uh, not just uh, a bunch of stories to help us understand economic gangsters, corruption, and violence, but also to think about solutions. Rapid conflict prevention support is one. Another 
is uh, something that we, we really argue for forcefully in the book, which is more systematic experimentation in development policy. So currently, a very small fraction of programs and policies in less developed countries are studied rigorously. We really don't know what the effect of particular health interventions or education interventions are. We don't know which anti-corruption efforts are most successful or less successful. And very often, there's a whole range of plausible policies that could be adopted. Think about corruption. How should we root out corruption, other than stationing mimes on, on street corners? Um, some folks in the policy debate say a key to rooting out corruption is raising bureaucrats' salaries. The idea there is if you raise bureaucrats' salaries, they'll have more to lose if they get caught being corrupt. They'll lose this fat salary. And that, uh, the, the threat of losing their salary, this, this, this high salary, could keep them clean in the first place. That's one approach. Now, that may be the case, but in, no one's really done a study to know if that's true. Maybe what giving uh, higher salaries to bureaucrats, the only thing it'll accomplish is getting a bunch of richer and still corrupt bureaucrats. We don't know. So uh, there's a lot of policies out there and very little evidence. What we argue for in the book is that development economics should follow the example of medicine and medical research and use more trials to understand what works and what doesn't work. Everybody here knows about medical trials. A treatment group is chosen. A control group is chosen. The treatment group gets a drug or some new medical therapy. And later on, we compare the outcomes in the treatment group and the control group to get a sense of whether it worked or not. It's very transparent. It's very credible. Uh, and over time, it's allowed medical research to make massive advances. Our life expectancies are higher. Uh, medical research has dealt with a lot of diseases. But actually, the medical trial approach is relatively new. It was only in the 1940s and 50s that it came, up, came about, that evidence-based medicine was developed. We think there should be evidence-based development economics. And it could be done in a pretty straightforward way, very similar to medical trials. Very often when governments implement a new program, whether it's an anti-corruption program or a new health or education program, they do it on a pilot scale, a small scale to start with. They start in a small number of towns or cities or villages or states, and then they roll it out nationwide. NGOs and nonprofits do the same thing. They'll often start it at the small scale before uh, expanding. In this kind of setting, the uh, pilot group, if they're randomly chosen, could serve as a treatment group and the rest of the country could be a control. That way we can get rigorous evidence on what works and what doesn't work. I'm going to give you one example. Again, uh, there's a lot of plausible policies that everybody thinks are going to work in development. I've, I've worked for a long time in Kenya for the last 11 or 12 years, a lot on education and health. One of our goals in our, in, in our projects in Western Kenya was improving learning in primary schools. We wanted kids to, to do better. It's a very important economic issue because without skills, without education, you can't be a productive worker. We tried out with our NGO partners two no-brainer interventions. The first intervention was an, a project that gave out textbooks to these schools in rural western Kenya. Schools in rural Kenya don't have enough classrooms. They don't have enough books. The kids are undernourished. There's a lot of things you'd like to do to improve these schools. Giving out textbooks seems like a no-brainer. The second intervention was a school health program that gave out free drugs to treat a health problem intestinal worm infections. So a lot of kids have like hookworm, roundworm, these terrible intestinal worms. 90% of the kids in rural western Kenya that we surveyed had these infections. Again, a no-brainer. Make the kids healthier, they'll do better. Well, it turned out one of these interventions worked spectacularly, and the other one had no effect, even though they both seem like no-brainers. Turns out when you give out drugs to these kids to kill the worms in their bodies, these hookworms and other types of worms, it had a great effect. School attendance increased dramatically. Actually, absenteeism fell by one quarter immediately for pennies on the dose. These are very cheap treatments. So improving kids' health kept them in school. But giving out textbooks had no effect on test scores, no effect on school attendance, no effect on grade repetition. Didn't, didn't affect anything. And these kids don't have many textbooks. Sounds puzzling. It's a no-brainer. We can actually learn from failures of this kind. This kind of methodology is useful because it shows us what's working and what's not and how to fix it. It turns out when we did a little more investigation, these textbooks that were given out, the official Kenyan government textbooks, they were designed by the Ministry of Education in Nairobi, and they were really written at the level uh, of the kids of the elite in Nairobi. They were very difficult. They were several grade levels ahead of what the kids in rural Kenya could understand. A lot of the kids in rural Kenya don't even speak English yet by grades four or five, but the whole curriculum's in English, and the textbooks are in English. So the textbooks were kind of useless for them. So what we've learned is the standard books don't work. 
but it's also pointed the way forward towards a better policy, revising the textbooks, investing some money in developing better textbooks that will be useful for these kids. Sometimes in development, no-brainers don't work, and this kind of methodology can teach us that. These are just illustrations, of, co of course. The main point, we really argue, is development policy should be based on evidence, not on ideology. Global poverty is too important a problem to be left to rhetoric or ideologues rather than being based on evidence, evidence-based development economics. And one thing I can ask all of you, uh, probably a lot of people in this room are interested in development. You might have given to a charity or given a donation to some sort of nonprofit in the past. Have you ever asked if that nonprofit evaluates their programs, does rigorous evaluations to see if their programs are making a difference? Are they using these kinds of methods? I think we all should. I think next time, before we give to a charity, we should try to figure out what evidence they have that what they're doing is working. If we all do that, if we're all empowered enough to ask those questions, we'll start pressuring NGOs and nonprofits to rigorously evaluate what they're doing and stop funding programs that don't work and shift those scarce resources into programs that have an impact. We tell a bunch of other stories, economic stories, corruption stories, war stories in the book uh, and um, make links to development policy. I hope you guys get the chance to look at it and hope you enjoy it. I answered all their questions. Wow. Well, that's great. I have one, actually. I have one. Um, I know that you have some, do some work with the Gates Foundation, and they support yeah. some of the things that you do. Yeah. Can you um, talk a little bit about any other kind of foundations or, I mean, how, how do you develop the World Health Organization, things like that, just ones that we know about? Can you kind of rate them for us? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think bringing up the Gates Foundation is fantastic. The Gates Foundation among the development organizations out there has been really in the lead on pushing for rigorous evaluation. So I think people uh, there should be very proud of the work they're doing. They're actually setting up, there's a new organization they're setting up that focuses in particular on impact evaluations, exactly the kind I've talked about. They're funding them. And I've gotten some money for, from the Gates Foundation to study uh, the best ways to provide rural water in Kenya. And they've been very serious about wanting you know, hard evidence, good survey data, good research design to know what impact they're having. So they've been in the lead. Uh, the Google Foundation, Google.org, sorry for mentioning that name. I don't know if I'm allowed to here. No, I'm just joking. Um, they've also been very good at that. So actually, Google.org, the Gates Foundation, and Hewlett have been taking the lead on, on pushing these ideas. In the big development organizations like the World Bank, for a long time, there was a lot of resistance to impact evaluation. starting to change. There are groups within the World Bank now that are taking impact evaluation seriously, that want scientific evidence that to know that what they're doing works. That said, it's still only a tiny fraction of all their projects that they're evaluating. And in general, in development, uh, the typical NGO, the typical nonprofit, including the very big ones, you know, people talk about CARE and all these other organizations, they're just starting to get into rigorous impact evaluation. So um, things are moving in the right direction, but they have a long way to go. We still really don't know how to root out corruption. We still really don't know uh, how to deal with some of the basic health problems in poor countries. And of course, one of the reasons why corruption is so important as an issue is it touches on every other issue in development. So if you want to improve education or health or water uh, and funding is being run through the government, you have to understand corruption in the government to know if resources are ever going to get there. So it's, a, it's almost like a first step to solving lots of other problems. If we can deal with corruption, if we can limit it, if we can prevent civil wars from occurring, again, during civil war everything breaks down, then lots of other development challenges can be met. Thoughts or your ideas, and uh, and the prospect that probably in the next 12 to 18 months, uh, you know, the global economic crisis is going to increase the risk of potential um, increase of poverty and so increased risk of civil wars in a lot of the world. What can we do? I think you've totally yeah you, you've you've caught up on, you know caught on one of our ideas. My co-author and I uh, just wrote an op-ed that came out in Forbes a few days ago that basically said exactly your point that with the world economy going the direction it is. And in particular, with commodity prices falling so much, a lot of poor countries rely for a big chunk of their, their income on export commodities. So in, in Rwanda, it's coffee. And in Ghana, it's cocoa. And in Burkina Faso, it's cotton. And in Zambia, it's, it's uh, copper. You know, and so when the price of that commodity drops, uh, incomes can fall very quickly. And that's exactly the sort of situation that we're concerned about. These rapid drops in income can lead to political instability and violence. So I think 
a mechanism of, of, of the sort that we propose, RCPS, Rapid Conflict Prevention Support, would be particularly important to have in place now, but it isn't in place. The big donors very much focus on investment rather than insurance. There are humanitarian organizations out there. You know, there, there are groups, the Red Cross and you know, the International Rescue Committee and whatnot. They do go into conflict situations or they do deal with famines, but they do it after the conflict's already broken out. They do it after the famine is already widespread. So it's like after the levees have already broken, they're going in trying to patch them up. And we think that's backwards. It's not cost effective. Uh, so um, we, we really do hope to, to push that point uh, as forcefully as we can. Another example, it's not based on our own research, but others who are doing similar research have found that in particular countries, uh, very well-known types of political violence increase in difficult years. So Hindu-Muslim violence in India is uh, you know, a well-known uh, type of, of, of social uh, pathology. Someone just did a study and found that in years after bad rainfall, there's more Hindu-Muslim riots in India. So uh, around the world, whether it's witch killing, Hindu-Muslim riots, civil war, big drops in income are, are dangerous. And uh, there's not enough insurance mechanisms in place. Yeah. So you talked about you know increasing bureaucratic salary to mm. prevent corruption. So one of the you know thing you know they're just thinking you know how it will be useful. So so I come from India and mm. I my, my father was a civil servant bureaucrat. Mm -hmm. So so the way it works is um, you know the the payoff from corruption is so disproportionately high from mm. the salary you get that you know it's not something which by any so if your salary become hundred times maybe there is a possibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's not, not something which the government can survive without raising taxes. So I'll give, a, I'll give an yeah. example. In India, if you look at income tax collection, only 2% of the people pay income tax. Sure. Not that you know, people cannot afford to pay. I mean, mm -hmm. There's a lot of rich people who do not pay sure. income tax. Yeah. Um, one case in point is the biggest company in India which didn't pay any tax for five years. So there's a big human tax. There's a, yeah. a thing called Reliance Industries where you know, Chevron, mm -hmm. for example, has a big stake in that. Yeah. So it's really big, and the guy is one of the richest guy, you know, who yeah. owns that. But you know, they don't pay any tax. So right. the thing is, you know, if I go after a guy, you know, the guy, you know, whatever he pays as part of corruption, is so much more. So yeah, will will model something like, you know, okay, if you catch, you know, whatever amount of, um, you know, money that he's not paying tax on, you'll get seventy five percent of that. If you do something like that, then it it may work. There's a possibility yeah. that work. But you know, just increasing bureaucratic salary. I don't see any way it's going to work. No, I, I think my co-author and I have the same intuition as you. Again, there hasn't been rigorous evidence on it, but India a few years ago, there was an increase in bureaucratic salaries, a pronounced one. In Kenya in 2003, they doubled policemen's salaries. There have been a lot of cases of countries doing this and no detectable change in corruption. So uh, again, we want evidence though to know for sure. Maybe in some places it'll work and in other places it won't work. I think if you think back to Bogota and the mimes on the streets, you know, putting mimes on the streets was something in that cultural context, in that moment, was incredibly effective. But it might not work in Beijing, it may not work in Bangalore, and it may not work somewhere else. So different reforms work or don't work in different places. And that's why we need uh, evaluation. I think your story about paying taxes in India is a great one. I have a, a friend, a colleague, who's an, an Indian economist. Uh, and when he was living in India, every year, he said, he's, he's very against corruption. He's worked on corruption in his research. He refuses to pay bribes. He'll go and try to pay his taxes. And the government tax collectors in the local office will refuse to let him pay his taxes. So there was one time he said he spent three days in the office. He filled out, I think he counted, I don't know if it was 70 forms or 80 forms. They just kept giving him new forms to fill out to try to break his will and force him to pay them a bribe so he wouldn't have to pay his taxes. But he wanted to pay those extra few thousand dollars in taxes. So when the system is that rotten, when the people enforcing the law won't let you be uh, won't let you follow it, you can understand why a culture of corruption would take root. If everybody else is corrupt, it's actually very difficult to be honest. It's a system. And it's not a system that only affects people in India. It can affect people in the US. There's recently been a scandal in New York, the, the Long Island Railroad, LIR. People in, you know, who lived in New York know about it. 97% um, of people who retired, employees that retired on the LIR, this just came out in the New York Times a few weeks ago, retired on disability. 97% were disabled. And you know, someone caught wind of this, and they went to one of the country clubs in Long Island where a lot of these guys live. And there were like five guys who had just gone on disability this year playing a vigorous game of golf and you know, walking up and down the greens. They, these guys are not disabled. Uh, but what ended up happening is when you're in a system where everybody else is cheating, if you're the one guy who tries to be honest, actually it could be dangerous for you. They could try to go after you. They might think you're going to rat them out. If you're not corrupt too, 
you're a threat to them. So it's a system. And uh, to change the system, uh, th different things may be effective in different places. That's what we really need to understand. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. I have one suggestion. Can you invite yeah. how people can contact you? Oh, that's, that's a great idea. Or yeah, we actually, so let me just say, we have a website and a blog that we've put up. Uh, and it's really easy. It's www.economicgangsters.com. And there's a blog. There's a Facebook page. Uh, and uh, if you have questions about the book, write us on the blog. We'd love to keep the conversation going. Thanks. <laughs>